Good evening. You know, sometimes when I'm talking, um, I'm always worried about what the menu is. But the good news is tonight that none of you are eating fish. Because if, when I talk, I annoy some people and it gets caught in their throats. But fortunately with the lasagna, nothing bad can happen, so that's delightful. So my topic this evening is um, uh, Judaism in the, in the Jewish state and um, uh, with particular concentration on, on the reform movement. And uh, I've been studying the, the topic for absolutely years. The way I got to this topic, uh, well, excuse me, was actually quite interesting. Um, some of you, for those, if any of you, I think there were one or two who were at my, my session at lunch today, um, I, I mentioned that I, I was doing, been doing a lot of work in the Israeli army and educated in the Israeli army. Um, and I, I once got a phone call, which was a very unusual phone call. By the way, the Israeli army is very unusual. Um, how we win wars indicates that there is a God. <laughs> because it, it doesn't work by normal army rules. The army is an ongoing Talmudic discussion. Uh, wherever you are, uh, the half the group is disagreeing with the recent instructions that you've just received. And it took me a bit of time to get used to it, because I come from a British colony, you know, where people stand in line even if you're only one there. Uh, so, so here I suddenly find myself in the Israeli army, and it works by a very different uh, dynamic. And one of the phone calls I received one night was, was really quite fascinating. They said we, we have a, a group of officers, and I spent a lot of my time uh, working with uh, Israeli army officers, and, and they said that we, we've got a problem. Uh, Israelis don't understand Judaism in the Jewish state. And I was a, a fellow from Hutzlaritz, from overseas, so what do I know? But they said to me, you know, outsiders sometimes understand us better than we insiders do. And I found that, well, on this particular topic, it's actually true. Israelis have absolutely no understanding of what Judaism in the Jewish state is about. Because in Israel, although we're supposed to love the stranger, we don't love anyone most of the time. That's why we have to give, uh, we have to have kiddushim in the in the Torah. So at least once a year we talk about it. But it, it was very interesting that in in religious realms, Israelis interact a lot on many realms. But when it comes to religion, there's very poor understanding of what the general picture is. So I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts. The first part will be some general analysis of what Judaism is in, in Israel, and then I'll concentrate uh, on the reform movement, and then you're welcome to ask uh, any questions you would like to. Um, we are one of the most studied communities in the world. That means we have more statistics about us than statisticians, and we've got a lot of statisticians. We are constantly asking ourselves who we are. By the way, this is very much a phenomenon of new and insecure societies. New and insecure societies want to understand themselves because they feel that once they have the knowledge, then they can give themselves some kind of direction. And you know, being 66 years of, of age in country terms is still pretty much in your infancy. Um, so, I'll give you some statistics which seem to be the best that uh, we can locate on any level at all. Um, we divide ourselves in terms of religiosity into four groups. Uh, and I'll, I'll give two or three words after I've given the, the general picture. 10% uh, of all Jews in Israel are defined as ultra-Orthodox. 13% are defined as modern Orthodox. 35% are defined as traditional, and about 40 or to 45% are defined as secular. Now, what do those terms mean? Because terms by themselves, without explanation, don't mean too much. Out and in America, by the way, you use the term orthodox to what we call both orthodox or modern orthodox and ultra orthodox. So there's a difference. In Israel, we're very, very much aware of the differences between ultra-Orthodox and modern Orthodox. Ultra-Orthodox belong, essentially find themselves in, to a large extent in Jerusalem. They're the people who live in Me'er Sharim, 
one or two areas of Tel Aviv, and as time goes by, because they have large families, they're finding themselves in, in other areas. The ultra-Orthodox is made up of essentially three groups. The Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox and the Sephardi ultra-Orthodox. The Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox are made up of two groups. The Misnagdim, the Litvaks, I come from a Litvak family, and the Hasidim. The Hasidim are made up of ten groups, <laughs> of whom you know about the Satmar and the Lubavitch, and there are another eight. Therefore, my good friends, the ultra-Orthodox are not a homogeneous, united group. And often I'm with an American group and we see an ultra-Orthodox person in Masharim, and it happened on one occasion with one group. Thinking that ultra-Orthodox are all Hasidim, they went up and they asked, do you like being a Hasid? Well, the person came from the Misnagdim, and there was almost a third world war in Meir Sharim. It was so insulting to a Hasid to be called the Mitnaged, or Mitnaged to be called the Hasid. You have to make it very, very clear. The difference is, by the way, is that the Misnagdim, or Mitnagdim in Hebrew, look a little, the men look a little bit like Al Capone. They wear very slithered jackets and withered hats, and you know, they're really out uh, uh, to create a good impression. Um, all the women of the ultra-Orthodox look real charming because most of them are wearing wigs. And the wigs are often better than the hairstyle, although the hairstyle is okay as well. So it, it, it's a mixed group. So when we use the term ultra-Orthodox, you know, many Israelis, and I, I've had this ongoing battle, of which I've obviously failed, to try to convince Israelis to understand the ultra-Orthodox world as very, very complex. And why is it complex? Because if you believe in the Gaon of Vilna, who obviously comes from Vilna, or you believe in Baal Shem Tov, who is the leader of the Hasidic group, um, those two people came from very, very different worlds. Uh, Lithuania and Poland were dramatically different. And let me tell you about my famous and most favorite uh, 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 teacher of my, in my life, uh, and I mentioned it last night, um, my wife's grandmother. Now, I met my wife. Uh, she was a, a child bride. Uh, I met her, we married when she was 18. And the only way I would get, get her that I was 24 and she was impressed with me. As years went by, she kind of learned she made a bad mistake. Uh, but there she was as an 18 year old and um, uh, we were dating and we actually, it, it was kind of rather a nice romance. Uh, we dated for three days and then decided to get married. Uh, in, in, in Israel, you have to speed up things a little bit. You're not quite sure of the timing. So uh, uh, she, uh, she had ready, we'd already get, decided to get married after three days, and then she wanted to bring me to her home. And her grandmother at that time was living in Israel. So she brought me, we went back to the family home, and uh, speaking to the grandmother, and the grandmother wasn't friendly. And I always thought people should like me. I've, I've fooled myself all these years. And I couldn't understand why the grandmother was giving me a real rough evening. And, she, and, I, and my wife had said, my fiance had said, she, my grandmother is absolutely fabulous. And then we started chatting. And then the grandmother said to me, well, tell me, where do your family come from? Well, I tell you, I don't know, but I've developed a wonderful lie. I say, near Vilna, near Vilna, therefore I'm a Litvak, and the grandmother is a Litvak, and she was frightened I like maybe came from Poland, but when she heard that I was a Litvak like she was, we gained the best of friends for the 20 years afterward that she lived. Now it's kind of strange. And it's nothing against people of Polish origin. Please don't misunderstand me just because of my wife's grandmother's bias. But I say it and I indicate it to say that often when we have, haven't been brought up in Europe and we kind of think of the European religious Jews, we very much forget that there are amazingly different dynamics 
within even the ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, of European society. The majority of ultra-Orthodox are defined as non-Zionist. Why do we call them non-Zionist? Because everything in Israel has to be complex. So we have the ultra-Orthodox who are anti-Zionist, about 10%, like the Satmar. About 10% of the ultra-Orthodox are Zionist, of which the Lubavitch are part. And the other 80%, we didn't know what to call them, so we called them non-Zionist. So what does non-Zionist mean? That they ex accept the existence of the State of Israel, but they're waiting for the Messiah to come. They might have to wait a long time. But that's really what the ultra-Orthodox group is in Israel. It is wrong to believe that they all hate Israel. It is just not true. 10% of their 10%, which they are in the Jewish community of Israel, uh, do not recognize the, the state of Israel. The others recognize the state of Israel. They call themselves the soldiers of God, which is unfortunately the exact uh, terminology of Hezbollah in Lebanon. So it's a bit problematic. I wish they could think of another term. But um, basically, that's they waiting. It's a waiting group that is waiting for the redemptive period. The second group, 13% of the Jewish population, are modern Orthodox. They, unlike the ultra-Orthodox, serve in the army. And not only do the men serve in the army, but they are very, very patriotic. In fact, in today's Israel, they are something like the old kibbutz people. The old kibbutz members used to be the creme de la creme in the Israeli army, totally committed to the state of Israel. Things have changed as years go by. The issues of the Six-Day War and the territories have complicated Israeli society. And today, in many cases, the creme de la creme of the fighting forces are modern Orthodox people of whom the overwhelming majority live in the state of Israel, and a certain percent, about 15%, live in the territories. And when we read about it here, the settlers, which is often a problematic term in the overseas press in particular, we should know that many of those people are called settlers are modern Orthodox who live by choice, by theology, theological choice, uh, over the Green Line, trying to return to the historical homeland uh, of the Jewish people. And that's uh, part of the idea of the living over the Green Line. 35%, including us reformed Jews, are traditional. The traditional group is divided into three sections. You see, in Israel, there's no such thing as one section. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine if anything would be simple in Israel? We would be so bored. See, it's such a boring country. Nothing really goes on there. So we have to make everything difficult. But the, um, the traditional group are actually divided into the Sephardi, the North African and Middle Eastern Jews, who are the largest part of this group called Misorti traditional. And then you have the conservative and reform movement, which are relatively small, but not as small as we might think. I'll come back to this in a moment. Now, what is the difference between the Sephardi, the Spanish, originally Spanish Jews, and the Ashkenazi, who all come under this title of traditional? I must tell you a story. We have some wonderful neighbors in Jerusalem. We live in Jerusalem, and um, I'm a social anthropologist and a social historian, and I like to listen to what people say. Fortunately, in Israel, we don't have a thing called political correctness. So it's the most wonderful country in the world to study. Because everyone tells you all the things they think before you ask them. <laughs> so it's one of those places when if you want to do a research project, the object of who you've spoken to gives you the subject of your research. So it's actually a wonderful system. So we had some neighbors next to us in Jerusalem. And they were an absolute wonderful family. They're a North African family from Morocco. And the most interesting thing about them is that when you ask them to speak quietly, it sounded as if the volume went up, but they never quite realized it. Now, unfortunately, uh, I like the family very much, but unfortunately they argued a great deal. Tremendous argument. And their argument was, was as a gift to the neighborhood. 
A gift to the neighborhood. Everyone five houses on either side heard about this argument that was going on. So I actually learned about a lot about Israeli society by hearing how they spoke to each other. Very interesting, very honest. By the way, it's an honest country, uh, a little bit aggressive sometimes, but it, it really is an honest country. Um, now, this particular neighbor, his name was Yaniv, and he went on a holiday to South Africa, and um, he came into contact with uh, Lithuanian Ashkenazi Jews, and one day we were having a conversation. And he says to me, he tells me, what, what's your job? So I, I told him I lecture at Tel Aviv University, but he really wasn't interested. He said, I understand you teach at another place where there's kind of some sort of Jewish studies. I said, yes, it's called Hebrew Union College. So he said, well, what do you do at Hebrew Union College? So I said, we're speaking to him in Hebrew, and I said to him, well, well what do we do there? We're training um, uh, young men and women who will become a rabbis and I was about to say educators and cantors. And he said, hold on, you've been here in Israel a long time, but your Hebrew isn't so good yet. Uh, do you just want to repeat your last sentence? So I said, yes, I, I teach at the Hebrew Union College, and we are teaching young men and women who will be rabbis. And he says to me, it can't be. So I kind of, I'd been teaching at HUC for about seven years, and I thought it was a reality. So, you know, it wasn't the reality show, it was the real thing. And we had the most fascinating discussion. That when, we, when I spoke about Reform Judaism, and where he was in his Judaism, we understood each other on absolutely every level. He called himself a traditional Jew. He would go to walk to the synagogue, his local Sephardi synagogue, with a kippah on his head on Friday night. After dinner, because he felt he was quite a religious person, he would shout to his youngest brother, run, I'm bored, at which case run put on the television so he wasn't breaking Shabbat rules. <laughs> so this is kind of a, this is inventive, uh, inventive way of uh, uh, dealing with things. Um, and then there was this uh, uh, interesting situation of Shabbat. He went to the synagogue on Shabbat, and at, when he came back from the synagogue on Shabbat, he took off his kippah, and then he went to watch soccer, football, okay, uh, uh, you know, soccer. So uh, it was this uh, very, very interesting uh, situation um, that, that we have here, whereas uh, um, Yaniv and I understood each other on just about everything. What Yaniv didn't understand is how a woman could ever be a rabbi. And I want to tell you that in Israel, the challenge for the reform movement is very much that this idea that a woman can be rabbis is not yet understood. And why is that? Because most Jews in Israel come from countries where there were not rabbis in their societies. So it isn't that they were against the idea of rabbis, they just need to be educated. And that will take only about three generations. <laughs> but it was very, very interesting that Yaniv and I, as traditional Jews, I see myself very much as a traditional Jew, Yaniv and I would understand each other on so many realms, but this issue of women rabbis. No. Look at your woman rabbi. Yeah. Hasn't Yaniv lost out yet? I mean, who's gained? Tell me, who has gained? So I look at Yaniv every time I see him and I say to him, Yaniv, I say to myself, you don't know what you're missing. So that's really why being a Western Reformed Jew in Israel is so wonderful. 40% of Israelis are called secular. Secular in Israel is a very interesting term. Secular, when you speak about secular in the global environment, you think about an atheist, a, a non-believer. But Israeli secularists, in fact, the major, overwhelming majority of Israeli secularists in the best surveys are defined as secular 
but not anti-religious. Now let me try and explain this thing about Israeli secularists. They have all the holidays that you can imagine. Let me go through statistics of holy days. 68% of Israelis fast on Yom Kippur. 82% of Israelis light Hanukkah candles. 90% attend Passover seders. 80% con uh, contend that God exists. And 77% of all Israelis believe that there is a higher power who governs the world. The statistics show that Israelis are in many, many ways much more religious than one thinks. And among the secular group, the feeling of religion is not that religion is bad, but that the religious chief rabbinate is totally and utterly corrupt. So what's happened in Israel, and as I mentioned earlier, trying to explain to Israeli army people, because they were trying to grapple with their own feelings. And they were saying, I was asking with these army officers many years ago, who are you? What is your definition? And they would say, I'm very confused. Because we believe in a tremendous amount of Judaic principles, but we just can't stand the chief rabbinate. And it has a terrible, terrible reputation in Israel. And that is the tragedy of Israel. The tragedy of Israel is that, in a sense, Judaism has been taken away from vast sections of the population who, if they had the possibility, would reclaim it for themselves. And that's the role of Reform Jewry. Let me go on to the second component of my presentation. Today, in terms of religious belief, we are finding some very, very interesting new behavioral phenomena. Just a touch of history. Stage one of modern Jewish history was the ideological period. Zionism has some of the most remarkable writers the thinkers, Chada'am, and Buba, and A.D. Gordon, and Baruchov, and we can go on for many, many of the great, great writers. That was stage one. Stage two was setting up an infrastructure. That's when you have the Kibbutzim, and the Moshevim, and the Bank, and the Histadrut. Tremendous amount of institutions. By the way, I often meet Palestinians. And the Palestinians are very interested in how we build the Jewish state. And I said to them, after you've been talking for a hundred years, which the Jews did, then you have to build things. And the Palestinians listen to me very careful because they know that that's one of the big problems. They haven't built institutions. The Jewish people are one of the best institutional builders of any group in the world. And I've studied this concept of institutions. We are so good that in most synagogues, you almost have a committee which is deciding what the name of the next committee is going to be. <laughs> and this is a major achievement. And highly institutional people succeed because you have a structure for growth. And that was our second stage. We built massive institutions before we even had our own country. By the way, we even had an institution called road building. And the road building institution has a Guinness Book of Record for the worst road ever built in history. <laughs> it is from the Kinneret that goes down. The British looked at it after we built it and didn't believe that anyone could build a road so badly. But we told them it was the first uh, chance, so we'll do better in the future. And some of the ro Israeli roads are very good today. The next stage was statehood. And then we came to where we are now. It is the disillusionment of the old ideology. Kibbutz, which was wonderful, is not what makes people tick in. The old ideas of collective living, which I think had wonderful components, 
I grew up in a Zionist, socialist Zionist youth movement in, in uh, Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe, that when I arrived in Israel in 1967, the day before the Six-Day War, we were driving from the airport to Tel Aviv, and uh, I'd never been to Israel before, and every time I saw a tree, I asked the cab driver if this was a kibbutz, and he said, it's a tree. And then I saw another tree, and he said, I said, is this a kibbutz? And he said, no, it's a tree. I tell you, by the time we get to Tel Aviv, the driver said, I never want to go with this guy again. So, um, things have changed. In that vacuum, a new Judaism is a light, is of such importance, it's unbelievable. The light to this coming stage of Israel, because we want content, Israeli society craves for meaning, craves for depth, craves for understanding of a heritage. Our discussions are very, very tough in Israel because they based on so much information, interpretation of information. And that is why this new Judaism which we have to bring to the state of Israel is of such importance. It needs to be the collective possession of those citizens who are of uh, a Jewish background. It's terribly important. One of the phenomena that we have as part of this new expression are these religious non-formal organizations which are being formed all around the country, sometimes influenced by the reform or conservative movement, sometimes on their own initiative. Just to take one or two of them, there are between 150 and 200 of these organizations in Israel today, locally formed, okay, not not sort of a ministry of some ministry in Israel decided to do it. Groups of people are getting together. And two of the most remarkable ones that I have attended, is one of them which is held um, for many months of the year at the port area of Tel Aviv, organized under the auspices of the reform movement. And it is beautiful. You sit there on the Tel Aviv port, if those of you who've been there know it's a very large and lovely area, and the chairs are there, and there's no such thing as membership, and the people of Israel, on a Friday afternoon, with the kids on the bike, suddenly see, for many of them, the first time the most welcoming form of prayer services that they have ever seen. And as you sit there, and the sun goes down over the sea, it's absolutely beautiful. You have these Israelis who, until that very moment, Judaism has been the strange thing conducted from the headquarters of the chief rabbinate in Jerusalem with all its negative connotations. And they sit there and are becoming part of it. And you know, with my sociological eyes, I just look around and I see the beauty of it. Someone who went out to take the child or the grandchild for a ride sits down and as part of the service, we are told, stand up and turn in any direction you want and pray for a better future. And some of these Israelis who have never prayed are being introduced to prayer in the context of an authentic Israeli society uh, situation. It is absolutely beautiful. Very near where we live in Jerusalem, there's an area now called the Tachana where the old uh, train station used to exist. It's amazing. You go there on a Friday evening or for Havdalah service on Saturday evening, and out there, once again, in a very different environment, filled with most beautiful music, same thing. People starting to sit down and be introduced and coming within a kind of environment. See, we Israelis didn't think that we needed spirituality. We thought what we needed was Talmudic arguments. But we've had enough of Talmudic arguments. We need something purer now. And this is the stage where I believe that the reform movement 
has one of its most outstanding challenges that we just have to take this possibility in our hands and present Judaism in a way which is acceptable to the Israeli psyche, to understand what Israelis really want and Israelis really do want something. I'm not even sure what we should call it. We still have to work on the terminology. We might have to think of terms which aren't quite the same as Judaism in the diaspora, because it has a different context. When you're the majority group, as distinct from the minority group, your Judaism has to take on different components. And so here comes the challenge for the reform movement. By the way, it's true with the conservative movement, but I'm not as informed about them, so I prefer not because the reform is better or anything else in the conservative, but because uh, this is the organization that I'm uh, so attached to. Within the reform movement, we have to have a strategy. There's, we can't be schmutter businesses anymore. The world is too sophisticated. We have to work on strategy. And within the reform movement today, although I doubt whether too many of my colleagues in the reform movement would agree with my terminology, that's okay, because I'm right, they're not. <laughs> but the terminology that we should be using in terms of the two potential strategies are the following. One is the building blocks approach, and I'll elaborate, and the other is the dramatic moments approach both of which are valid. Let's work on building blocks approach. Some of you may have met a Rabbi Gilad Kariv, who was here some time ago. Uh, Gilad's a wonderful human being. Um, he actually married uh, our daughter and, and son-in-law. Uh, Gilad is a firm believer in the building, in the building blocks approach. What does Gilad feel in his heart of hearts? It's like a Lego building set in his mind. I don't know if he's aware of it. But when <laughs> Gilad thinks and talks and writes, and I have contact with him, it's like the Lego set. And he's trying to put the little pieces together, sometimes of different colors, sometimes of different shapes, sometimes at different angles, to build up a slow and solid reform movement, until a short time ago, called progressive, but everyone called us reform, so in the end we decided we must be reform, so we changed our title. And he, in a most remarkable project, because I remember it 10, 15 years ago, and I know what it is now, has built to just take a few of the figures, 42 congregations, 57 preschools in 12 cities, 101 reform rabbis in Israel, 1,000 weddings per year, 2,000 bar and bar mitzvahs a year, and one quarter of a million Israelis who in the last survey defined themselves as reform. It is remarkable. Now what's the problem of the building blocks approach? It's very, very, excuse the expression, non-sexy. It's not good for marketing. Because whether you have 39 congregations, or 40, or 41, or 42, you don't feel it's changing the world. But I must say from an Israeli perspective, Israelis like things which are local, indigenous, and also take time. Israel doesn't as a society deal well with quick sort of twisty ideas. We, we think out of the box, but there's a reticence to, in some realms to move too fast. So the building blocks approach, which I think is actually quite remarkable, 
And I remember the days when I would say the word reform in Israeli society wouldn't know what I'm talking about. And now when I say the word reform in Israeli society, oh, is that we know a reform rabbi? Or our grandchildren, Shimon Peres' grandchildren, go to reform preschools. And across the country, you can go to many, many members of parliament who in deciding where they wanted their children and grandchildren to go, realized that the Israeli secular school system did not have enough of Judaism and therefore wanted something more and certainly didn't want to go into the conventional establishment religious groups. And therefore, they've actually started to understand much better than we could have believed what, uh, what we might be able to do to Israeli society. I think it's a remarkable project. And from my own experience of changing societies, I know that sometimes the slow, less exciting, less interesting, long-term approach, which is hard to convince people how important it is, with historical hindsight, we do see it's been very, very important. The second approach, as legitimate, is the dynamic moments approach, which is read, led by Anand Hoffman. Let's take the issue of the women at the war. The women at the fall is a very, very dramatic concept in Israeli society. Whereas building one more congregation is never mentioned in the Israeli press, women at the wall are mentioned in the Israeli press every time, Rosh Chodesh, they're at the wall. It's very dramatic. And Anand Hoffman is probably known better than Bibi Netanyahu. <laughs> she certainly probably gets more press. And the women at the wall concept, it's a strategy approach. So I think it's important to understand we're talking about two clearly worked out approaches to how we in the reform movement can get a place in Israeli society. It hits the headlines. Seeing women in Israel with a talit on their shoulders. The ultra-Orthodox, by the way, are major players in helping us. Because every time they spit at us, it gets the top point on the television program in the evening. And by the way, Israeli television is different from yours. It's just a little bit better. My apologies. American TV is terrible. But Israeli TV is outstanding. Israeli TV is educational TV, even if it doesn't call that. And Israelis watch, we watch our TV. We have three national TV programs, and Israelis watch TV all the time. It's a learning uh, a mechanism in Israel. And there you would see uh, uh, Anat Hoffman and Women at the Wall. Very dramatic, very influential. And by the way, and I say this, please understand it as... I say it only in praise of Anah. An amazing mechanism of getting the world reform Jews and other Jews around the world to look at the issue of reform Jewry, which if we only did the building blocks approach, it would be of no interest at all. So these are the two strategies. Let me just conclude something, an article which appeared in the Haaretz newspaper kind of the equivalent of the New York Times in, in Israel, um, which appeared in the Haaris newspaper three days ago. Um, it's about Tanya Hoffman, Anat's daughter, called My Mom the Feminist Firebrand. <laughs> Front page article in Haaris newspaper. Front page article both in Hebrew and English. I brought the English one. Um, where uh, uh, Tanya Hoffman uh, discloses some very uh, unusual components about her mother's personality. And uh, Tanya Hoffman, uh, the Hoffman family in itself is, uh, is quite an interesting family, but the, the one part um, that I wanted to mention, by the way, uh, the article is written by Judy Maltz, who writes uh, excellent material. All, all her stuff is very, very serious. Um, uh, in speaking to Tanya, 
um, tells uh, the following story. Tanya told uh, Judy, the writer, uh, the following story. She says, um, there's a moment in their family history where uh, Tanya's younger brother, uh, Anat, and her former husband had three children together, um, uh, discussing, and uh, the younger uh, brother asks uh, the mother, Anat, um, who would she choose if she had to choose between her family and women of the war? And Tanya says, um, the answer was just a little bit embarrassing for the three children. Which means a nut shows women of the war. Now I say that it's a very interesting comment. To move things in society, and we know it all societies in early stages, you've needed people who mshugana the davar, crazy about the issue. If we think we're ever going to change anything in the world by the slow, nice process, all I had to do to convince me was to be with Rabbi Micha at the museum of the, um, this morning, of the uh, civil rights movement, and the amount of quotes which appear there would show that the Native American movement in this country, the civil rights movement, had an internal discussion again and again on how do we change our reality? And when push came to shove, unless you had leaders and participants who were go to, prepared to go a long way and endanger their lives, as you people well know, to achieve their goals, nothing would have happened in the United States. So the point is, when I look at the reform movement in Israel, I want to conclude with three comments. Firstly, we are doing much better than anyone thinks. And if they tell you, you I'm incorrect, tell them they're wrong. <laughs> First comment. Second comment is that our potential contribution to Israeli society as we move into this, the fourth stage of our national development is remarkable. We have a great deal to give. Listen to the service we had tonight. I was sitting there and tears were coming to my eyes. I'm a little Israeli guy here for a weekend, a nice weekend albeit, but just a weekend. What am I hearing coming from the big man? Prayer to the State of Israel, the Chana Senish story. Sunday I'll be giving an explanation of Shoah, but Shoah in terms of the Israeli context. What wonderful things, if I just could take that service and give it to Israeli society and say that Judaism can be all these stories of which Abba Kovner and Chana Senish are totally integral to our contemporary Judaism, then we would know that our contribution as a small group in Israel, even if the figures are correct, quarter of a million uh, is still nowhere near a majority, that's a remarkable issue. And the third comment on this I conclude, believe it or not, I do end my lecture sometimes, is life is hard in Israel. Really it is. You know, I, I, I say this uh, only a few times a week, about seven times a day. Uh, it's, it's a tough place. It really is a tough society. We're still forming ourselves. We disagree, we're confused, we're frightened. And in that context, we have made unbelievable achievements. And on the most personal and egocentric level, why is it important for me personally to be a Reformed Jew? Because on the days when I become disillusioned, I need spiritual guidance 
to help me to stand in front of my students and the people who I am dealing with in Israeli society and to give them real hope. And the reform movement, among many of its wonderful achievements, is a way of looking at the future. And societies in crisis need directions and directors to lead us to the future. And that is why, for me, personally, the reform movement in our young state is so important. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Absolutely. Ask anything. I know it's one thing, um, Professor Lips, we did was we sent out to the entire congregation attend all six talks. <laughs> uh, not all of us were able to do that, and not all of us will be able to. So uh, ask anything about tonight's topic or any other subject, too. Please, please do. Some yeah. Use topic. me, by the way. Just exploit me, <laughs> insult me. I will only feel at home. <laughs> so have no fear to be. You don't have to be nice to me. Uh, I've already got a. Uh, Two rabbinic uh, students here have been yeah. awfully nice to me, uh, as well as Jan. Uh, so please, anyone here. Yeah. How do you? Uh, how is the chief rabbinic uh, chosen, and how can you get rid of him? <laughs> if I knew the answer to the second question, I'd love to answer the first question. Um, he's appointed by. Uh, this is what the corruption is. It's a closed. Um, male-only club that almost no one can become a member of. And he's, he's elected by the process of this club, and the club has to get the consensus of the government, but the government really won't object to what the members of the club want. So although there is a, 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 a the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which is a government body, which has to actually and agree to who um, are they going to be the rabbinic uh, chief rabbi appointees? In reality, it's actually done by members of this uh, closed uh, club. The closed club is about uh, 25 members. Um, you know, once again, because we're in Israel, we have two chief rabbis uh, the Sephardi chief rabbi and the Ashkenazi chief rabbi. There are serious discussions about reducing it to one chief rabbi. <clears throat> which means instead of having two corrupt institutions, we will only have one. So that's already the good news. Life is getting better. We are going to change it, and it will change, because Israeli society is reaching a tipping point on a significant number of issues, of which we're seeing it in the relationship of non-army non service of the ultra-Orthodox. There's a tipping point there. There are 1,500 ultra-Orthodox men who are beginning to serve in the army. There are processes which are going on. I know it's always slow, and, and sometimes we get frustrated, which means that there are going to be changes of where the government takes on its governmental responsibility, and it is going to happen within the chief rabbinate as well. Um, the pressures out there, you know, um, you have to talk about an issue for a long time before it happens. And the talk on the street today is, we no longer want the chief rabbin. Now there's some very interesting issues. There's a group called, there's a group called Zohar, uh, which um, um, Shai, the, um, the Orthodox rabbi uh, in Memphis, uh, identifies with, which are modern Orthodox people who are as angry as I am about the chief rabbin. So what's very important in societal change is often not what outsiders feel angry about, but what insiders feel angry about. And because within the modern Orthodox group, you know, 13% of Israeli society, there are powerful and articulate voices who are saying, we are not prepared to accept the jurisdiction of this particular kind of body. That is already the, in, in, uh, the indication that uh, we will be um, be changing the structure of the chief rabbinate. By the way, the chief rabbinate fulfills important roles. Uh, otherwise, you have anarchy. We don't want vacuums. That doesn't help societies. 
but we have to change the nature of the uh, chief rabbinate totally. Please. Uh, since Gerald, uh, stockbroker, Princeton, he understands numbers, if you could just educate the group about how much money we're talking about in the chief rabbinate's budget. And Shai will tell you that Sohar and Beit Hillel, these two groups, are fairly anemic. They're, they're, they're trying, but they're not powerful. Is that That's fair right. to say? That's, right. That's true. The, the Zohar group, is, is, is what they're doing is very important. Right. They're offering alternative weddings and alternative bar mitzvahs. But you're right. In real power, they, they, they don't have real power yet. But because there's a real need for them, they will get stronger. How much money is in the budget? In terms of the money, I mean, I'll tell you why it's such an interesting question. We have absolutely no idea, absolutely no idea, because the money that the chief rabbinate gets is not part of a direct government budget. You see, the chief rabbinate gets percentages of vast amounts of money which are given for uh, religious services uh, around the country anyway. For example, um, if you want your uh, restaurant uh, only serving kosher food, the owner of the restaurant pays uh, a lot of money. Part of that money, which probably a third is under the table anyway, goes to the chief rabbinate. So that's why when we look at figures, these kind of figures in Israel, there is a vast discrepancy between the official budgeting figure and the figure of what is uh, is going on in reality. Uh, but it is a very, very significant amount of money. Uh, now, what the good news is, by the way, talking about you know, where the chief revenue is the problem, uh, the reform movement is now uh, going to have five rabbis who receive government funding. It's the first time in Israel's history. Five rabbis are, uh, two of them have already started getting salaries. Uh, the way it was worked out because the chief rabbinate refused to carry out government orders. So the Ministry of Sports and Social Welfare, if I remember correctly, is paying the salary. But it makes no difference because it's just a government budget kind of thing. But, ref but reform rabbis are now, are now government employees. This is from three months ago. So the amazing things are happening here. But once again, you know, you ask about the budget. Because this is really a chief rabbinate responsibility, but the money is actually coming through another government ministry. So that's how we that's still, uh, we're still very middle, uh, 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 Eastern European in our behavioral patterns in Israel. So a lot of the things are, government things work with the kind of intricacies of Eastern European society. So unfortunately, the real figure, actually no one knows. By the way, even high officials in the, in the Israeli administration, don't really know what the figure is, because there's so many other mechanisms which work in terms of funding. Any other questions, please? Yeah. Could you say about 1,500 are now serving the water? What do you think the price is? Uh, is significant? Yeah, okay, the question was about the 1,500 ultra orthodox. Uh, it's going to grow. It's going to grow. The process of getting it to grow is um, indirect impact. You know, when we, you look at societal change, it doesn't always work to go head on. Sometimes you have to work from another side. What we have to do to the ultra-Orthodox is to say the following. Your economic position is intolerable, which is actually true. The ultra-Orthodox belong to the poorest 30% of Israeli society. Partly because they have such large families, and in, in just a tremendous amount of cases, that although some of the men work, they're not really real income earners. So the income depends on the women. So in that kind of situation, the most powerful form of persuasion is to actually go to those ultra-Orthodox people and say, we are prepared to develop a complex, different kind of world. You won't have to work a full day. Work half day. Another half day you can study and pray. And what is going to happen, because the nature of the human being is that when they're getting half a salary and their level of expectations increases, that we know that the whole development from a socialist to capitalist society depends on the expectation motive. That what happened in Israel when socialists 
suddenly find they could earn a little bit more and go on a holiday overseas, they started wanting more money so they could not go on holiday once every five years, but every three years. And that is actually why many of the most astute analysis of Israeli society actually looks at this kind of process as potentially being more successful than necessarily going into the battleground on this issue. So I don't know if we will never get to all of the groups. Uh, some of the rabbis are very, very powerful and will just not allow them to go into the army. But we must know, it's a very interesting situation, that many of the yeshiva bochas, many of these ultra-Orthodox uh, males, are not students. They suffer by having to stay in a room for hours and hours of the day. And when they can be offered a kind of 50-50 solution, which means they can get into the workplace, which is going to improve their economic situation and their status situation. Because while some people have status through study, they will have status by income earners. That in itself is going to generate some change. If you ask me in the next question how long it will be taken, yes. then I'm going to say, oh, you dare. Yeah. I don't know. But I can see change coming about. Yeah, please. Your job skills. Okay, so that's what's happening. So now the, the, the first stage is, you know, what are the, how do you get the job skills going? Um, uh, as I mentioned at the uh, lunchtime meeting today, uh, you have a woman by the name of Adina Bar Shalom, uh, who actually comes from a Sephardi ultra-Orthodox family, who set up a Haredi college. It didn't used to exist. And so you're having Haredi entering the workplace as a result of new skills. I want to say something about Haredi skills. Very, very interesting. Apparently, if you have studied Talmud for years and years and years, you have unbelievable potential skills of which one is, we know in the world today, uh, the next generation of young people are going to have concentration spans of between three and three and a quarter minutes. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. If you come from a Talmudic background and you are then pushed into computer sciences, you have built in yourself the ability for intense concentration, which much of computer work requires, which will be a skill, and they will be better skilled than many of the other Israelis whose concentration span is much less. So there are people out there in Israel. You see, we can't waste human beings in Israel. We haven't got enough. So there are people out there in Israel who come from ultra-Orthodox backgrounds, who've adapted to the new commercial economic world and are succeeding. And as soon as we get a few of those uh, role models out there in the field, the uh, employers are going to turn to them. By the way, they're already turning in very significant numbers to ultra-Orthodox women. Ultra-Orthodox women are very, very good, loyal workers. They don't want to go out for lunch. They want to work, and then they go home. So they actually, in terms of the workplace concept, they have the potential of being very, very useful. So the skill issue is really not to try and give new skills which they haven't got, but the clever idea is to try and take advantage of the skills that they already have. And they are skilled and well-educated people, maybe by different definitions uh, that you and I would uh, normally uh, consider. So that's really quite an interesting situation. I've sat with the ultra-Orthodox, by the way. They are were, they were fascinating people. I mean, the fact that I disagree with everything they say is of no importance. Uh, what is important is, is their, their, the way their minds work. That Talmudic thinking does unbelievable things. They can go from tangent in 10 directions and always come back to the initial point. Whereas I'm, you know, or in my mind somewhere in uh, Argentina at that moment. Uh, they, they, they keep the concepts within their mind because of their training. And it's very, uh, you know, their religious training is very, very sophisticated. So they've got important uh, skills for us. I feel like Phil Donahue. He was a talk show host uh, back in the 70s. Um, and looking at the quality of leadership in the room, I I'm going to ask a question uh, related to our car talk. Uh, your, your, gracious, your gracious host, uh, Jan, 
she gave me a copy of the article that you probably read yesterday, the news about the unity of Hamas and the PLO, reaction from Kerry and the government. And you know, Jan said, he may not have read this because he was in flight. You may want to give it to him when you see him. So I gave Paul the article. And last night, uh, some people asked some very incisive questions about the external threats to Israel, about Iran, of course. And your understanding of the way Israelis address complex issues vis-a-vis -vis the way we do, even though all generalizations are wrong. Uh, if, if you could please comment on the issue of clarity versus the search. Great. Because she wanted to make sure that you were covering it. And, and I didn't tell you, Jim, you know, he read the article. He said, uh, you, the way you put it last night, Americans read the... The, the news and we don't know uh, who's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and you said Israelis or academics read it and then they wait 10 years and analyze it. That's right, exactly. But can you expand on, could I you will. speak to so many Great. American leadership Great. groups? Great, um, I hope I'm not going to insult all of you. <laughs> But you know, living in this two world that I live in, and I really do live in two worlds, and I, I can't tell you, you know, for years and years and years, I used to have this, this kind of most amazing situation where one day I would spend uh, six hours teaching at Tel Aviv University, and the next day I would come into Hebrew Union College and spend four or six hours teaching American students. Israeli students and American, one day after the other, was a mind twister for me. <laughs> I cannot tell you, although in some ways we are just human beings, and we know that's true, in other ways our minds and the way we look at issues in our two societies are very different. Let me be very simplistic and I hope in no way condescending or insulting. Americans believe that the world is about how quickly you can get a solution worked out. That is how your mind works. I mentioned last night when I speak to uh, State Department people, they, I meet them different levels and different political groups and different people coming from the official realm of American society. And I'm always fascinated by the question which will come up always. And that is, what do we have to do to move from A to Z? And unless I can give them an answer, I'm actually of no value to them. And we in Israel can't give those answers. In Israeli society, our discussion is, are we at D, or are we at F, or are we at L? Because basically our lives, our minds think in terms of slow progression towards something that could possibly be the end goal. Now, if you can understand what the implications of those two mindsets are, you can understand sometimes why we find it difficult uh, to understand each other. John Kerry, I think, was a terrific guy. I, I tell you, I think his heart is really in it. He came to Israel. A tough issue. America has got so many global problems at the moment. Every minute that your Secretary of State spends on any issue means that the other multiple issues that are developing in the world, we have no idea what a complex period of universal history events we're going into. And he spent a lot, a lot of hours trying to understand the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. His problem was that he was convinced that he would come back to President Obama with a final document. And Israelis and Palestinians thought this was just a bit of a joke. Because unless you've argued for 20 years, what's good life all about? It's so fundamentally different that that is really what it's about. Americans want clarity. Americans want a, an issue which is solved and tomorrow you go on to the next page. 
Middle Easterners live in profound moments of past. The past is as important as the present. And therefore, what happens in a get the thing done, get the product into the marketplace, get on to the next product, as a distinctly historical part of the world, which are Israelis and Arabs, means that the whole way of our interaction is going to be filled with uh, problems. Just let me go back to the classroom environment. When I spoke to the Israelis in a classroom, and I wanted to have an easy class, I would ask a question at the beginning, sit down for an hour and a half, they would argue among each other, I was completely irrelevant, and everyone was happy. I went into my American graduate HEC, you ask a question, you get an answer, they give me time to talk, they ask a question, they give me time to talk, they ask another question. It is as if I'm on two different planets. Two different planets. The Israeli process is because the ongoing argumentation is the stage that we're at. And we don't know where it leads. The American classroom is the class finishes in 42 minutes. And by that stage, I want to put a V in my notebook and we're going on to early biblical studies. So I don't know if I've managed to quite explain what it is, because I live it, and my, for me it's so much part of who I am at the moment, but this is why sometimes we find ourselves in these very, very uh, different uh, kind of situations. We have different mindsets which are relevant to the world uh, that, uh, that we live in. We're becoming more like Americans as time goes by, by the way. We, we, we're becoming more like you. And fortunately, you're not becoming more like us, or else we'd all go mad. But it's actually, it is a, a situation that this younger generation of Israelis is thinking increasing on the American kind of basis, partly because so many of our people are in high tech. We've got two of our children in high tech, and I can see their mind is actually thinking differently uh, from mine. Jimmy? Jimmy, please, yeah. Do you think that the difference in Israeli and American television is a result of that? Of that, of that. Ah, good, very good. Question, uh, Jimmy's question was the, the nature of different television. Uh, I think there's a different term, we call it in Hebrew, anima amin, the basic concept of understanding. Uh, American television doesn't see itself as an educational mechanism. Uh, they, they gave that responsibility to the universities. And it's, a, it's an economic uh, entertainment mechanism. Israeli society regards television, you see, because we're still desperately trying to understand things, we have to take advantage of all the mechanisms we have to help us in our learning process. We're at different stages of national development. So in the Israeli case, the television has a very, very profound uh, educational and uh, political role. Um, it, it's amazing to listen to Israeli talk shows. You know, sometimes I listen to a great talk show and I think, well, that would be a wonderful topic for a year's academic course. Uh, it's not often that I listen to an American talk show which I would say that. I would say, you know, it might be a good idea to forget. Um, and once again, my apologies. But they, they come out of different principles. You find it with Israeli uh, uh, newspaper reports as well. Even our sort of not such good newspapers are very, very much trying to inform the population or to influence the population. Uh, that's why we actually read a great deal more in Israel uh, than you do in the United States, uh, at least the, the generation above 30. So, so I think that's what it really is. I think the answer to your question is, I, I think we're going to become more like you uh, 20, 30 years down the line. Uh, but at the moment, we are still uh, desperately feel that we need uh, uh, serious, uh, serious education. Israeli talk shows are quite, quite remarkable, by the way. Um, the, you have to be very skillful in listening. The reason why you have to be skillful in listening to an Israeli talk show, 
that if there are five people around a table, they're all speaking at the same time. So you have to be very, very skillful at picking up the various voices which are all being used at the same time. Now, why does it work like that? It's not a coincidence. It's because the issues seem to be so serious in Israel that it's hard for an Israeli. You might well have found it. You know, you're in a discussion with the Israelis and they constantly interrupt you. Just let me finish the sentence. And it's hard for Israelis to actually do that because there's a, a tension of life and they want you to get ahead and want you to make sure that you understand their perspective. And, and that covers pretty much uh, the whole of society of which um, Tel Aviv is, is the case. Let me say something very problematic about the media in Israel. And one of the greatest threats to the media in Israel is the tremendous, excessively powerful influence of very wealthy American Jews and their impact on the Israeli media. Of which Sheldon Arison, if I pronounce his name correctly, Adelson, uh, is one of them. He has bought out two newspapers at the moment. So we are petrified in Israel, not, not, only, not because of his political views only, although I, I have certain issues, but that's my own problem. But, um, but it's, it's because the, the tremendous danger, which we've never had before, of extremely, as you know, wealthy Americans who are getting more and more involved, uh, possibly because they believe it's for the good of Israel, but in the, in the terms of trying to develop Israel into a democratic society, outside media influence is extremely dangerous. So although we speak about at the moment the freedom of the press, there is a very serious discussion going on and a great fear in Israel that one of the great achievements which we have reached in Israeli society, which is an open and free uh, press, may in fact be uh, under threat. That's something there. Two, two, two more questions, Mike? Sure. Yeah. So, so there's been a, a large immigrant uh, uh, movement into the state of Israel, mostly from Russia. How, how is that? population of people uh, filtered into the, the layout of Judaism that you described it earlier. Interesting. In Israel, we, we are very much aware of the phenomenon that we call cultural retention. That means it's very interesting. People come to Israel and place very, very high on their list of priorities, carrying on being from where they came. So we have with Russian speakers, for example, as you're right, in the 1990s there were one million Russian immigrants who remained for a considerable period of time very Russian, although they were living in Israel. They, immediately the Israeli television uh, framework developed a Russian-speaking radio station. Uh, there was immediately a uh, the seven uh, Russian newspapers at the moment in Israel and three weekly magazines. Um, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of uh, continuation of uh, Russian environment. Now what's happened generally with the Russian immigration process is a sharp division. People who came to Israel over the age of 40 didn't get into Israeli society, remain in sub-societies of Russian speakers. People who came in younger groups, and particularly if they came from the large cities like uh, Moscow or um, St. Petersburg, uh, uh, Odessa, Kiev, uh, Minsk, those sort of uh, cities, large cities, and they were younger, developed, integrated in the economic realm, not in the social or cultural realm, but integrated very quickly in the Israeli economic structure and in that realm have been a remarkable positive group to the development of the Israeli economic society. Very, very interesting. The other comment about the Russian speakers is they've had a tremendous influence on the political society because 80% of all Russian speakers support the right wing of Israeli politics. And because we're a small country, when you have an influx of a group that at one time was 20% of the citizens, and the overwhelming majority of those, that subgroup, belong to one political perspective, it changes the political reality of Israel as well. 
So immigrant groups have a tremendous influence. So the, earlier it was on the Ethiopians. Their uh, impact was less because they felt alienated. The Russian influence uh, was very serious. Now we're having the French coming in. The French are articulate, worldly, upwardly mobile. Uh, the numbers are going to increase all the time. There are many, many signs that are showing how many French people are coming in. They will influence Israeli society, bringing with them in very strong ways uh, their own uh, uh, cultural background. Uh, we are planning for a year down the line an influx of Ukrainians. Ukrainian Jews are going to be coming next. We can see it. Um, by the way, the next wave will be Russians. Russians who actually came on Aliyah to Israel went back to live particularly in Moscow because Moscow was going through an economic bubble. We foresee in a few years time Russia going into economic decline. Many of them already have apartments and even contacts in Israel. We imagine that some of them, uh, maybe even a fairly large number, will actually come back to Israel. So that is what we actually see. We see ourselves very, very much as a society that in the foreseeable future will be absorbing Jews from around the world, because although things are better than they've been at any time in history, they're still not great. George. So that is really the Sorry. point of uh, immigration. Yeah. Professor, uh, this is not what I want to ask you about, but speaking from somewhat limited experience, I can assure you that American talk shows are anything but remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had the privilege of hearing you talk in Jerusalem, I think in 2011. Yes, Michael, that's right. Is that right? And we, my wife and I were both fascinated with the talk as we were tonight. When we left Jerusalem, we, among our stops, were in Haifa, and we went to a reform congregation there. Leo Beck. Okay, and we heard the rabbi, and we walked out of there, and we were struck by what appeared, what seemed to us to be extreme discrimination against reform Jews. And among other things, he said that Reformed Jewish couples had to leave the country to get married because Reformed rabbis could not marry them. I think, if I heard correctly, you said that your daughter and... Yeah. So what our daughter and son-in-law did, because we know that's a reality, um, it was no problem. They happened to be in New York together. They went to City Hall, New York. I happened to be there. They officially got married there. It took about 10 minutes. I didn't realize the wedding ceremony was over. But when the judge said, where's the ring, I realized that must be the, the wedding ceremony over. And they came back to Israel and they had their wedding. Well, have things gotten better since 2011? Was yes, it yes. Um, it only gets better in Israel. <laughs> see, I'm an optimist. Um, you, you see, what happens, one has, to, one has to just deal with the reality. So, you know, you, you plan, uh, we've got many friends, by the way, uh, that the children just didn't want to get married with the local rabbis. It wasn't because they were reformed. They were orthodox, but they didn't like the process. So on one of their holidays, they made sure they popped into Cyprus or some other part of the world where they would do it with their local officials and then come and have their party back I I in Israel. So this is still the stage that we're at. So what we did with our daughter uh, and son-in-law's wedding, uh, we invited Gilad Kariv. No one would have even felt for a moment that Gilad Kariv isn't an officially recognized rabbi by the Israeli establishment, and everyone had a great time because Gilad is such a wonderful rabbi. So what actually happens is kind of how one deals with it. Um, what one just has to work the system in a way that feels uh, more comfortable. Um, I just want to say one other comment. Um, it's a lonely business being a reform rabbi. And it's easier for me to be optimistic because in, in no way is my career on any level at all influenced by the uh, legislation. I can understand why some of our rabbis, and particularly what was happening at uh, Orfadash in, in Haifa, why some of them feel, uh, feel differently. So my analysis is very much moving back and trying to look at the general picture and that helps, that influences me, but people in the field, as you may well have heard, uh, still find it more, uh, more difficult. My point is that there, there are ways of working the system, and that's what one has to um, recognize.
Yes, sir. I, I had a Grizzlies question um, in a minute. Right. Is, that, is that something minute about uh, baseball? No, no, it's actually, was, no, <laughs> it was going to be my high holiday sermon. Uh, Rabbi Bowman and I will work on other topics, but something you said in the card that I think everyone here will think about when they leave tonight. But first, Art. Oh. Art. Pastor, you mentioned several times. <coughs> Credits his Shabbat here. But they're the grandmother, grandfather, the scouts. You ought to know, Paul. I didn't tell you that they're known as Saba and Sabta of all the caravan scouts in Israel. In fact, last summer, how many people turned out for the reunion? Or how many were there? 700? Yeah. Well, you know, I can't say that everyone has heard about reform. I, you know, that, that I would never say. But if the surveys show that quarter of a million define themselves as reform, that is, is the most significant part. So there's parts of Israel, by the way, which we haven't influenced. Um, really, that, that is true. I mean, we haven't got, with all the 49 or 47, depends which figures we're taking, odd congregations, even a congregation area only reaches so many people. I mean, it's the same in Memphis. I mean, you've got this amazing Temple Israel. How many people in Memphis know about Temple Israel? And it's a great place. So even when you do this, the question of how many people really know about you, uh, you know, is always a, a question. However, the question is the process. Are you in a better position in any of this analysis than where one was a few years ago? And my comment and my understanding of what's happening in Israel is the position is getting better. And that is really what I, I'm talking about. And as I say, there are some Israelis who have heard of reform. It, it's weird to them. They don't understand it. My, I spoke about my next door neighbor, who a woman rabbi. He until today can't work out, you know, what it really means. And uh, but but you know, you work on it and, and develop it. So so that's what I would say about uh, people on the caravan and those sort of groups who come. Um, but some of them really do know about it. By the way, a lot of Israelis come to uh, reform camps in Israel. Uh, two of our children did, and had a tremendous impact on them. So sometimes you have to leave Israel to come to reform in America.